Live from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California, it's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Okay, hello everyone, welcome to the right, Silicon right. Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. My guest here is a good friend, John Luke Chatelain, who's the CTO of Accenture Analytics. I've known John Luke for a long time. Great, great person. Former executive at HP when I, when, uh, back in the day when they actually had great cloud, great technology, great M&A. Now they're actually going on different M&A strategies, the spin merges, <laughs> and uh, you've had a great journey. We've known each other for a long time. Oh yeah. Great uh, uh, technical, uh, but also business acumen. Thanks for spending well, thank time. Thank you. So, John Luke, I got to ask you. You know, we've you were on my first cube in 2011, 2011, the extraction point, uh, and a lot's changed. And you and I have had conversations over breakfast many times around the transformation in the industry. But here in Silicon Valley right now, you can't get more excited. And there is so much AI, artificial intelligence, or augmented intelligence. This is really the big conversation. And right. every venture capitalist I talk to. Every startup has an AI angle. Every company has an AI product. Where did AI come from? It just came out of nowhere, but it's certainly AI washing. People are using AI as a way to try to pump up their relevance. But this is a sea change. I mean, we're seeing the industry uh, transition from what has been a 20 year run of IT and data centers, the glass house from the mainframe to the PC growth. And then really that demarcation really came in the mid 2000s with the iPhone and cloud coming on the scene. You're now seeing a complete transformation of business. Yeah, analytics yeah. are the heart of it and that's what you're doing. So I want to get your take. Do you think AI is hyped up right now at, a, at an all-time high, or has it got more hype to go? And two, what actually is AI? Right, well, fair enough. Um, so, is there more hype? Sure. Um, I said AI is a new big data, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the good thing is AI uh, hype is really justified, right? Because uh, the result that we see coming out of AI are pretty outstanding. And we finally are at a point in time where all that work that has been done in AI for the past 60 years since Turing, right? Mm -hmm. Is possible, right? And that now unleash uh, a huge set of capabilities and, and it's going to make your life and my life much easier, that's for sure. It's interesting too, and, and we're going to get into some of the work you're doing at Accenture because Accenture has been, you know, grew up from that old big six accounting days when, you know, and the, those, those guys did all the early mini computer, client server, software rollouts, ERP, CRM, but now with the market with cloud, Accenture's got this huge practice of, of, of big data and, and have zillions of data scientists, and we're going to get into that, we've talked about that before. But before we do that, the, the thing that we're seeing right now is that the computer science explosion around software is really centered around machine learning, and machine right. learning has been around for a while, right? And, and the concept of neural networks is getting everyone super excited. That's been around for a while. It's been around for a while, yeah. So I got, I got to ask you, and I, I made a comment on Facebook the other day and Twitter, and I said, you know, someone was talking about machine learning, you know, is hot. And I said, real computer scientists write their own algorithms as well as take advantage of other libraries. So talk about that dynamic because algorithms are hot again. You're hearing like people calling those algorithmists, you know, as a new title. Um, and that's important with machine learning because you can certainly borrow a lot of machine learning libraries out there, but at the end of the day, the best part of machine learning and augmented intelligence is actually writing custom algorithms. True, and it's, um, so the, I think there's two sides of it. There's the fundamental science behind AI, and there's outstanding work that is being done by you know, some of our clients and our partner in the industry, like Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Amazon. They, they do a lot of the fundamental work. I mean, the work of Jan LeCun, for example, at Facebook is pretty amazing, or Hinton at, at Google. Uh, the, uh, and then there is the industrialization of that work. And I think that's where it's really interesting because a neural network is a neural network is a neural network, but it really you get the power of it when you start teaching that neural network how to behave in a given industry situation. So there is a lot of generic application that are uh, really amazing. I mean, look at the Google car, right? Yeah. I mean, what they do in video analytics, you know, blow you away, right? Uh, but there's also a way that you can use those uh, fairly modern algorithm to work on very mundane tasks that are difficult to solve. Like, take mortgage processing. What if we could teach a dual network to understand the six inches worth of paper that you have in your mortgage mm -hmm. and distill that to something a human can understand? And if you bring that to a bank, how can a bank understand the quality of the mortgage that they have by reading those documents using, using AI? And that's where 
the coding comes into play, all the training and, yeah. and tuning that algorithm to work for that given industry. How early are we in this analytics trend? I mean, people are certainly excited about it. My young son is 21 and a lot of young people are getting into the business and, and software is attracting a lot of people into computer science, which is fantastic. But you know, you've seen a lot of cycles of innovation. Where are we? Peg, peg uh, progress bar for analytics. Well, you remember in 2011, we spoke about this and um, I guess you and I were prescient, right? Because uh, you said, you know, where, where should I send my kid to college? What, what should what should they major in, right? Yeah. And I said mathematics because data scientists are going to be a rare commodity, right? So we are in a stage now where analytics are being understood um, by at least the CXO level. They understand that being uh, a data-powered enterprise, leveraging analytics to derive business-changing outcome, uh, is there. Now we are not there yet in in the. Uh, total industrialization and deployment throughout all the firm, but the awareness of the good of analytics is there. And that, yeah. to me, it, it's very important. And it's the best time to be in this industry. I don't want to retire, I don't know about you, but. I, <laughs> I wish I was 21 retire. again, because I mean, I had so much great action in terms of development. It's, it's, so, it's totally cool to be writing code, it's, and, the, and there's so much range now in what you could work on. It's not just writing code and, and, and programming. You can actually work on architecting great stuff. And it's, it's so great, I mean, but, and the, but you're seeing the transformation Here's, here's my big thing, I've been talking about this on theCUBE and my show for since we started doing this a couple months ago, is that the impact to society is huge. I mean, you, just this week we saw the United Airlines um, uh, guy getting yanked off the plane because they were overbooked. It was the dumbest thing I've ever seen because they could have easily solved this with really good analytics. And so their, yeah. their, their business is under, under fire now they lost a billion dollars in value because of this incident. Forget the lawsuit from the guy who was dragged off, but the point is, it could have been avoided. It could have been avoided, more than likely, with the right kind of analytics. Maybe it boils down, you know, one of the big issue in analytics today, it boils down to availability of skills also. That there's a lot of aspiration that companies have to do something with analytics, and they stumble in the fact that they don't have the data scientist, or they don't have the, uh, the IT department that understand the complexity that is behind the scene you know, to make some using AI or using any form of modern. Well, this analysis. is an example of, to me, I use that I use that because it's in the, in the news, yeah. it's hot, everyone's talking about it, it went viral, and just not stopping, it's just, it's just being trolled by their competitors. But this is happening to a lot of businesses. This isn't United, it's just one that we know about because that's front and center in the world right now. People fly a lot and people are outraged and it's, it's, it's a tragedy really. But this is an example of what's happening to businesses everywhere right. by not having the right data, not having the right analytics. They're not incorporating data into their business and and stuff is failing. Right, they're not powering their business by data. I think that's the issue, right? They're using data, uh, they've been using a you know, way to price, for example, their tickets for a long, long time, right? Mm -hmm. they've been, but that's, that's about using data as opposed to understanding that you're going to power your, your firm by leveraging data. Right? And it's a change of behavior, right? We, I think enterprise today still like the tribal model, right? Oh, I know what I've been doing for the past 20 years, and I'm an expert. And Data all that. warehouse, blah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But you know <laughs> what? Um, you have to reinvent yourself every day now as a human being, especially in our industry. And firms have to uh, really reinvent themselves and understand that unless you start making decisions based on data, Right, you got to make the wrong decision. That's no doubt, and there's a war going on at this data layer. We're seeing it at the cloud, um, and so I got to ask you. I mean, obviously, you see the big cloud providers. You got Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle. This should not be discounted because they're, you know, they have database advantage, and they've got some good numbers, seeing some traction there, trying to get into the cloud native world. But if you, if you think about the um, evolution of the industry, right? We mentioned from let's just take some dates, 1980 to. Um, uh, 1995, internet. You had TCP IP was really a kind of a, uh, an enabler around standardizing the network stack, yeah. right? Everything else was still proprietary and applications yeah, yeah. would above the you know, IP layer. So everything got standardized, we created massive growth. And of course you had the PCs coming in, the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, you know, and Intel, just volumes of PCs being connected. So you had internetworking, all that stuff created massive industry. And then it kind of became an IT problem. Yep. Now the same, plumbing. Kind, that's the plumbing. <laughs> now the plumbing is turning into machines, so you have machinists versus plumbers, and the cloud is that new force. So that is that, that transition is happening. So the cloud is oh, the wild west. Mobile devices are the new, new PC, so you right. have a proliferation of devices, Internet of Things, PCs. So now the cloud wars are happening where there's jockeying. So I want to ask you, just from as a technologist and someone who's out in the field with customers, 
what has to standardize in the cloud for companies to truly interoperate across multiple clouds, to have full frictionless access to resources from an application standpoint? Yeah, I think there's still a need of um, kind of having a cloud neutral type of set of API so that uh, customers can uh, leverage different clouds uh, without being tied or hog tied <laughs> to, a given, to a given pass layer or something like that. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity here uh, to uh, ensure that your application, John, uh, can run on Cloud X on Monday and Cloud Y on Tuesday or run on both at the same time mm -hmm. so that if one goes down, well, you can flip to the other one. I think there's still a lot of efforts to be done and in that neutralization of the of the API layer to talk to the to the cloud infrastructure. Yeah. Um, that, that's where there's opportunity. But uh, the cloud's the right place to be, there's no other doubt. Right? And a lot of what has, has helped is also the level of automation now that we have behind the scene to, to power those cloud. But this is a place to be, and, and I, I'm kind of surprised that, well maybe I should not, but. <laughs> say it, go ahead. I'm kind of surprised that uh, there's still a significant amount of enterprise that are, um, afraid of the cloud, right? And that's that un, what I call unfounded fear of security in the cloud. They don't know what to do. I mean, my take yeah. is they just don't know what to do. They're uh, out of their comfort zone. They're out of the comfort zone. <clears throat> uh, you know, people still like to, to hug their hardware, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I am convinced <laughs> that some CIOs. You're a hardware hugger. Some industry. The tree huggers they, here in California, yeah, you got the yeah, hardware I, huggers. I, I think some CIOs <laughs> in some industry probably go in their data center room and go hug their red right? Well, a lot of times uh, they spend a lot of cash for this stuff, so it's like, they, it's like buying that big car that no one wants anymore and sitting in your driveway and you're like, Oh my God, I, gotta, yeah, I well, want to drive it. I paid a lot for this money. Yeah, I well, got to drive this beast around. Yeah, why don't you take Uber instead, right? <laughs> exactly. It'd be so much easier, right? We're here with Jean-Luc Chatelain, good friend, CTO of Accenture Analytics, um, really in the, in the, in the position uh, to see everything in the industry. He sees a lot of customers, uh, also has a great technologist background, has been the CTO of HP uh, back in the, in the days. Um, you've had great experience, seen many cycles of innovation. Um, there's a sea change. Certainly this IT transformation has been this you know, 20 year operational system and people, personnel and process, now completely being radically disrupted. We use the United Airlines example as that could have been avoided and any lean airline should have ha never had that problem. Uh, and they'll be dis disrupted by another airline by, invented by a millennial, probably. <laughs> but this is, this is the issue, right? So how do you hire people? I mean, as just as someone who's the CTO, you got a, a lot of, I don't know, what's the current number of data scientists on your team, but. 1,300. 1,300, it's a huge amount. What's the age like? What's the background? How do you hire? And what do you look for in these data scientists? You know, when you, when you, when you talk to people, they got to solve problems. It's not so much about the tech anymore, that's kind of like tooling, but you got to build something. Right. There's an outcome involved. All right. So we, uh, we are very selective in our hiring, right? uh, but we try to uh, find the best out there and regardless of where they are. I mean, we are literally a global company. We will hire people from any country uh, as long as they have the right credential, uh, whether a master or a PhD, for example. Mm -hmm. We love computer science. We love, uh, of course, we love mathematics, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but we, we are not you know, completely closed, right? Because uh, no one has a monopoly of innovation. So what you have to, I think when you talk to a candidate, uh, yes, you have to qualify the uh, bona fide in terms of education uh, in the space that we're interested, but you have to kind of see if that person's got that innovation fiber. And, and that's really what's, what's important to me. That, uh, what's your take on Silicon Valley? And uh, I know you've been here, um, you live in Atlanta now, but you travel all over the place, you practically right. live here. Um, but there's, a, there's now a global landscape, you're starting to see um, the entrepreneurship fabric be global. Um, China, and Asia Pacific's growing like crazy. Um, connectivity's everywhere. Internet of Things, devices from autonomous vehicles, uh, to sensors on airplanes or whatever, and people and watches that can de detect diabetes um, are being developed. I mean, this is kind of people have the things on their on their body, the wearables, and you got cars now out there. It's a big data world, but it's not just Silicon Valley anymore. So, what's your take on Silicon Valley these days? Well, I think Silicon Valley is still the model, right? I mean, everybody aspired to have the same fabric. It's it's very untouchable, right, uh, but everybody knows everybody yeah. around here, right, and, and so there is a great ecosystem which is, which is uh, a long time, I mean, it will be a model for a long time, but I, I'm happy to see the same thing happening in Paris, the same thing happening in Atlanta, happening in New York, 
uh, happening in uh, Israel or in, in countries where you do not think, like Italy, for example, uh, as uh, in you know, a lot of uh, software We're in Italy. talent. We're in Italy. Which uh, city has the most uh, well, uh, action going on? I would say Rome, uh, Milan, and uh, Bologna, of all places. Mm. Uh, you know, we, it's one of the oldest university in, the, in Europe is in Bologna. I think it's really? probably the oldest university. And in, in France, Europe. you mentioned Paris. Any place else in France? Uh, so it's um, a great place to live there, and there's a lot of smart people there. Yeah, How it's, about math? It's, it's kind of a place to be. So there are some pockets of innovation in uh, what used traditionally uh, were um, industrial uh, space. For example, Toulouse, right, which mm -hmm. is all around aeronautics, uh, has, has uh, some pockets of innovation there, but really it's, it's centered in Paris and, and the surrounded, surrounding area. So is there a correlation between food and and uh, analytics in terms of horsepower, France. So they know how to eat well, over there. America, you know, in an outburg right on the corner here. You know. Food, I don't know, but the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the better the wine, the, the better you'll better know. Better the software. The better the software. That's, that's a golden rule. I mean, uh, a lot right. of push add butter to the software and a good glass of wine every time. It's good stuff. Okay, so I got to ask you about the startup scene because I know that you keep an eye on, on on a lot of trends. You were early on Object Store when you went back to DDN as we were one of the co-founders of that 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 whole deal. Um, you know the founders there. Uh, you were at HP. You saw a lot of trends and you saw the train coming, so you were way ahead. And we, we when the, again, it's on the YouTube. We were talking about it in 2011. Mm -hmm. We were pretty much right what we talked about. Um, but the startup scene has certainly changed a lot. Hadoop is not what the end game is. In Cloudera filed their S1, I was very surprised to see that they had a massive liquidity event in 2015, which means everyone got most of their stock out, but now they're going to go public. Intel's holding the rest of the investment. But Hadoop didn't become the big deal. It became data. Right. Um, and so that shifted to the startup scene. Uh, what's the startup scene like in the data area? What are you see a lot of vertically oriented? Oh, I'm a food uh, uh, thing. I'm doing you know some sort of point application. Right. So I see, I see a few things. Uh, there's a really interesting space. It's what, what we some people call it data engineering. Right. The, the, from the moment you get the raw data from your various operational system or your external data source to the moment you can make the data consumable by the data scientists and the models. Right. Um, that area, which used to be called data integration or data yeah. quality, data preparation, was never well regarded. It was kind of like the thing, the thing you don't want to do behind the scene. In fact, you'll go hire an yeah. Accenture to do it for you. You've been punished. <laughs> you do the data wrangling. Yeah, you go, go do data integration. <laughs> right? but, Scrap uh, the toilets. But you this know. area uh, is really facing what I call a renaissance. It's a renaissance of data preparation as a first citizen of the whole value chain, because you don't get good insight out of bad data, right? So in the startup world, we've seen the emergence of many uh, you know, newcomers that want to change data preparation, making it much more uh, accessible to business analysts as opposed to accessible by geeks, right? And think about it, a data scientist today Spain spends 80% of its time or her time in data preparation. Do you think it's well spent? Probably not, right? Yeah. So there's... Uh, well, let's talk about the old way and new way, because the old way you mentioned was a remedial task, people did it, like I say, you know, I always joke, you know, go to Siberia and do data wrangling, but, yeah. now, but that was more of a blocking and tackling kind of a mundane task, and there was known reports, and they were kind of slow. Today, the data is really, really important because you have real time Needs. You have, you have real and time. Also, you don't really know where the data value is going to be because the contextual elements of it could change overnight. Exactly. So there's and a strategic role here, isn't there? For, I think for a long, long time, what, what under the banner analytics, right, or BI, the, it, it all has been about verifying answers to known questions. And now, with the arrival of big data and powered by capabilities like AI, you can find new questions to ask of your data. I think that's, that's really what's transformative. Now, we can get a data scientist, let him swim in the data, for lack of a better word, and, and get their ha ha moment, and then operationalize that uh, in, into the firm. So, what's changing, the, the phases in data uh, preparation haven't changed. You still need to capture data, you still need to clean data, you still need to keep its traceability, its provenance, its lineage. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to make it consumable by normal people now. So instead of something which is done in the bowels of IT with 
believe it or not, most of the time, very little understanding of the context mm -hmm. when you're in IT. It's just bits. They don't understand. Yeah. They're not SMEs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but instead of doing that, you can now, with those new tools that are coming about, automate that value chain more and more, and then make that data available in a catalog that you can offer to all of your business analysts, wherever they are in the firm, and they can go and you know, use that data to produce whatever is useful for them, either whether it's report, whether it's a dashboard, or whether it's calling their, fair, their friendly data scientist and yeah. can find some new answers in, in that data that they have. We're here with John Luke Chatelain, CTO of Accenture Analytics. Uh, we're seeing all the um, great data work that you guys are doing. Um, talk about um, Accenture and how you guys have changed because you guys are essentially building a very agile organization and you're using a lot of the technology. It used to be that Accenture, and I'm paraphrasing, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just going to say it. Accenture used to be a, like a consulting firm where you'd come in and all you do is you get paid and give me your watch, I'll tell you what time it is, right? That's the classic consulting business model. Now you guys are shifted to um, being a technology provider. We, we are because this is a massive opportunity, so you're vertically integrated, your own cloud, your own technology, and then you bring that to customers. Now you're not just consulting, you're doing that too, but you're putting it in context to delivering value with tech. Right. Did I get that right? No, you got, you got that. It's, 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 a, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it surprised me. I mean, when, when they reached out to me, I was like, what? I'm not a system integrator. I've never done that in my life. That's not my job, right? And I realized that uh, it's a company that is able to transform itself in real time, which is really in, in interesting. And, and it's, it's no longer just a people-powered enterprise. Right? It's a people and platform powered enterprise. And I think that notion of understanding that platform is a vehicle by which they can help our customers, as we say, turning to the new, right? changing themselves, right? is remarkable. So it was to me, I, it was like that, that, was, that is the best kept secret of the industry. But the level of innovation that uh, is coming out of Accenture in technology, not just in consulting, as you said, but in technology, yeah. uh, in the process of helping our customers turning to the new, becoming digital enterprise, becoming information powered, is, is really What's amazing. What's the coolest thing you're working on right now? Coolest thing we're working on. We're, we do a lot of stuff with drones. Right, I, um, so we have uh, work being done uh, around, uh, for example, surveying for, uh, plantation and looking for sick trees in the plantation so that we can direct people that are going to go and either uh, put some medicine on the tree or cut it down because it could you know, rot and be bad for the other. But we can literally send them to the tree that is sick in a plantation, as opposed to have them in jeeps going back and forth. On, yeah. And you're talking plantation that are- it's huge you know, terrain. Yeah. 10, so it's, they send the drones out with cameras. They send the, the drone out to the... camera, we, we survey the whole forest. We, and you can a, detect the, the decay on the tree. Right, we can or... detect, uh, DTA, we detect uh, also poachers, right? People mm. that come and cut the trees. Uh, and disease. They and, fire and any rockets off those drones? <laughs> those poachers? No, that's, uh, <laughs> that's coming soon. That's, I don't think it's going to be in the next release, but. Um, <laughs> Do a real time analysis. I got too many Twitter but, followers, so hold off on that one. But, um, but it's really funny because. This, um, is, the, this yeah, is the edge of the network, though. Flying cool. drones is a great example. You've got cars yeah, that are self driving, you've got drones that have intelligence to them. Right. This is a data challenge. So let's just kind of unpack that. A drone's flying out, it's got a camera, it's right. got to do a sensing, uh, send the transmission. Right. Back. It's IoT at its best, right? It's IoT at its best, and then you guys have to react to that, make decisions on it. All right. So we, uh, yeah, it's a great example. So there is some interesting technology challenge behind it that it was a lot of fun to solve. Is how do you, when you have say a hundred drones flying and you got to update the model because for some reason the detection where you're looking for is not happening. You got to go and send, you know, models to those drones that are in flight, mm -hmm. right? And so that they can have a new model and start behaving differently or start having better detection of what's going on. And, and it's not limited to drones, but right? now you can- Emergency gonna, response, you got agriculture, yeah. you got all um, kinds of supply oil, chain. Oil and, ga oil and gas, like surveying pipelines and looking for leaks, yeah. right? Uh, Wires, all that stuff. Yeah. Talk about blockchain, let's get into something disruptive, because uh, now you start bringing in supply chain, what just pops in my head is blockchain. Yeah, um, I have a lot are of. Are you bullish on blockchain? I'm very bullish on blockchain. I, I don't think we are ready for large-scale uh, industrialization of blockchain yet. There's still some unknown question, but the idea of at the end of the day, blockchain is uh, it's a ledger, 
that's non-temperable, yeah. right? And <laughs> so you always go back to reality. It's like back in the days where we, you know, you were writing a big ledger with big pages, and you could yeah. not tell double them entry off. accounting just yeah. to keep track of everything. <laughs> that goes away. I mean, this, this blockchain could radically change the nature of the firm concept that was written, you know, by, you know, uh, way back in the day, yeah. by I, Coase. I, I mean, the Coase, Coase's theories of nature of the firm yeah. was based upon old stuff. Right. Now you have blockchain, you could eliminate. But blockchain can ensure that anything that's happening to a piece of information, right, uh, whatever the transaction may be, uh, is, is traceable, number one, and it's uh, non-temperable mm -hmm. and therefore non questionable Good for supply chain. If you're right. transporting goods, you can see well, stuff in flight. Yeah, we can see stuff in flight. Think of uh, you know what's called the track and trace, right? In the pharmaceutical industry, for example, you know there's been a lot of track and trace effort around yeah. RFID and and all kind of stuff. But what yeah. if you could all do? You know, use blockchain mm -hmm. uh, also as a mean by which are you people can look, are people kicking the tires on blockchain? Yeah, yeah, people are kicking the tires. Financial services are they are rolling kicking. anything out into production at all? Or not yet? Uh, I think it's a little soon. Not soon. in large scale. I mean, this, it's this mostly in, in field R and D, basically, kind of prototype. Yeah, or, or POCs POC. type of thing. POCs, you know, so maybe yeah, limited, limited control environment, right? Uh, but there, there's a lot yeah, of. I'm so bullish on. I think blockchain. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I well, agree. people. I, we had some naysayers on my show that said, "Well, they they think blockchain is BS." Here's the thing about blockchain: you need an ecosystem to pull it off. But the money that's on the table that's disruptable, meaning if we organize together, it's trillions. Yeah. I mean, it's a trillion dollar land grab if people can organize in an ecosystem way. And I think that will happen, in my opinion. I've seen it before. So I'm totally bullish on blockchain. Yeah, Final question for you: I want to ask you, what, what if when you talk to your friends that aren't aren't CTOs? I know you have a lot of wine parties uh, at your ranch, um, and they say, John Luke, what the hell is this IoT thing? How do you describe IoT to uh, non-techies? Well, I tell Internet of Things. IoT is Internet of Things yeah, for the so folks watching. Yeah, so what I tell them techies. is that um, you know there's a machine out there, right? Everything is a machine. A cook, a cook machine, right? A cook distributor is a machine. Your washing machine is a machine. Your fridge is a machine, and that IoT is first is giving a voice to those machines, right? Uh, so we enable those machines to speak to tell us what's in the fridge, what's the temperature, or how, how you know what's going on with your laundry in the washing machine, or you know, how many Cokes are left, or Pepsi, not to favor any, any vendor, are left in the machine. No, not Pepsi anymore, they had that bad ad that yeah, went yeah. viral. And, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and now that machine can tell the, the supplier, right, that it's about to run out of Diet Coke or out of Diet Pepsi, right? And so it's, IoT is about giving a voice to machine and listening to them. They have a lot to say, right? So you can listen to the machine, and as a function of what they're telling you, but aren't you can change your behavior. Aren't, aren't people IoT too? We are machines, absolutely. That's my favorite line, is when somebody walks into a Starbucks and checks in, they're an IoT device. Yeah, right? chip implants are coming next, but we are aware, I mean, Internet of Things, had that book I used to read to my kid, Thing One and Thing Two. Um, yeah, that's the, you know, the, the story, but the point is, we are things. We yeah. have wearables. We're going to have we sensor are. networks on us. Yeah, we have proxies for us, but we are we are gesturing machines. out. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to a guy who runs a bank, and he's like, "Our future bank. We're using all these fintech startups. We don't. All those core services are moving away off our core network. They're going to become a sensor network with ATM machines and servicing consumers yeah, with data." Yeah. All right, so final, final question for you as we end up here, give you the last word. Jean-Luc Chatelain, CTO of Accenture, here with me. What are you really excited about in the next few years? What's, you mentioned earlier you're, you, you wish you were, I said I was wish young, you're excited now. What are you really excited about right now, next five years? What's going down that is just intoxicating for you? I think we can uh, literally put, uh, with the uh, real emergence of tangible machine learning capabilities. I'm a very big believer in convolutional neural networks, right? Uh, that we can now bring a lot of goodness via analytics to people. I, the, the one I, I love is the work that's been done, for example, in mammography, right? Now you can use deep learning network to read mammograms and avoid you know, a potential disaster for a young lady or that, that has uh, an emerging cancer that we cannot miss, right? We can't miss it. It's, uh, I, I think it can, um, we can help educating pe people better. Yeah. Right? We can, so Societal benefits. Yeah, I, 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 exactly. That's well, you bring up a good point, just, uh, just to try Societal benefit. Well, here's right. the try, here's what I hear you saying, and I think this is what you're saying. 
we're doing things that we couldn't do for the first time that are just unbelievably awesome. And for the better. And for the better. Right. Because we have more compute and the data is available. Right. It's in, it's just in, in crazy and, and, awesome time. Yeah, it's crazy awesome time. Look at what's going to happen with uh, self-driving car. We're going to minimize the number of accidents. Yeah. Right. Well, this Let's first time legal around. challenges, societal society challenge. So great time to be a computer science and sociology major. <laughs> I mean, don't not? you yeah. think? I no, mean, I agree, right? Uh, that's that's the that's the curriculum. Well, math or computer science. Lots of social good will come out. A lot of uh, critical thinking needs to happen, though. I, right. I mean, we'll we'll pick that for another time. John Luke Chatelain here on the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. Great to have you, CTO of Accenture, good friend, uh, great expert, and uh, someone who's been in the industry a long time. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>